You probably have never heard of a man by the name of Henry Guinness and the prophecies that he gave in the 1800s and into the 1900s that were printed and made known. I think that this is going to be one of the most fascinating studies related to how men interpret scripture and use the numbers of the Bible, comparing them with the times and the seasons of the Gentiles and can come up with specific time frames when major events happen before they ever took place. I want to welcome you to the Manifest Telecast. I'm Perry Stone, and we're going to deal with a very interesting prophetic message today. The 1896 prophecies from Henry Guinness that have been fulfilled. And this was a man that had amazing prophetic insight. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is many, many people know nothing about the insight, nothing about his story. So let's get into this right now. The first thing I want to explore is a question that has been asked me from time to time. And that is, why was it that prophetic preaching came into more common uh, notoriety among the common people uh, with prophetic conferences in the 18 and 1900s, but you didn't see as much prophetic preaching before that time frame. Let's say around 1830. There was hardly any prophetic preaching. Now I'm going to answer that by sharing with you three important things. Number one is this, and that is that most common people had no Bibles until the English translation of the Bible came, came through King James, which was the 1611 translation. Then those Bibles were printed in mass, placed in churches, and of course, later on through the years, smaller Bibles, the Geneva Bible was printed. That's what the pilgrims actually came over here with. And so there were various versions that were printed. Then the Bible became common in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s through the printing of the Bible. So therefore, people had no idea what the Bible even taught, and it was all subject to whatever their minister was teaching. Number two is this, and this is important. No specific signs were being fulfilled from almost the destruction of the temple all the way through to uh, the time when Zionism was formed and World War I. In other words, if you had been living in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, and you would have read some of these verses about Israel. Israel didn't exist. About the Jews, the Jews were scattered. About the city of Jerusalem and what would happen in the last days. The city of Jerusalem was in control from 1517 to 1917 uh, of the, uh, the, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. So you're not seeing, even if you're reading the Bible, any prophecies come to pass. The third reason is that in the, late, in the early 1800s, there was a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Europe, which later came to American Canada. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, the gift of revealing the Word of God, of understanding prophetic things and the mysteries of God is opened up. And that's clear from Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel was told that in the last days, many would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. So those three things, the outpouring of the Spirit, the releasing and publishing of Bibles, and of course the fact that the signs begin to happen all gave rise to what's called a prophetic movement. Now let's do a little bit of history. If you know me, I love to history. I love to share history with you. There was a man by the name of Henry Drummond that began to host prophetic conferences in uh, Albury Park, and I hope I pronounced that correct, correctly, in England. And he held six conferences a year. And uh, boy, they were, they were packed out with people. There was a great interest at that particular time. Now, not only did Drummond began to do this, but there was a man by the name of Irving that became associated with these movements. There was also a man that was the name of, had the name of William Blackstone that was a evangelist, but he was one of the very early Christian Zionists. And that means he promoted the reestablishment of the nation of Israel and the Jews permit, permitting to, to go back to Palestine and live and build. And uh, so he, he, he lived from 1841 to 1935. Um, he wrote a book in 1878. Now remember that date, 1878, called Jesus is Coming. And it's 
I don't have that book. Uh, I have a book by A.B. Simpson with a similar title, but this was evangelist uh, William Blackstone. So what he began to write in the book was he began to write about the, re, the restoration of Israel in the hands of the Jewish people or the Hebrew people. What was significant about his book is his book gained attention among the British parliament leaders in Britain and in England and also in uh, the Protestant leaders in different parts of Europe began to pay attention to the idea of what he was writing and the scriptures he was using in the book. Now, in 1888, I came across a book that was actually given to me by a friend of mine who pastors in Memphis, John Sibling. He was in Africa at the time. I hope he's watching this. He can hear me talk about it. And he gave me a book that he got out of a LSU library because when library books, after a while, they sell them and replace them with new books. And this book from 1888 taught three things, that Israel would be reestablished as a nation, Jerusalem would be the capital, and the Jews would return back to Israel before Jesus could return. And there were people that he wrote about in his book that blasted him and called him a heretic, said that the church had replaced Israel, the Christians had replaced the Jews, and all what we call replacement theology. And he answered that in this book. Now, somewhere among 25,000 books I have, that book exists. And um, right offhand, uh, I can't remember the name of it. I have it written down somewhere. But anyway, so let's talk about this man, Henry Grattan uh, Guinness, 1835 to 1910, uh, was an Irish uh, minister. And he ministered during that time frame. He was, he was accredited for the evangelical awakening. Um, he began preaching despite persecution, drawing very large crowds in Dublin and um, Ireland. Judges, parliament members, professors, and high-ranking uh, professionals began listening to him. He preached in Ireland, Wales, and England, and was eventually called England's greatest teacher of prophecy. Now, right over here is uh, a picture of uh, what he looked like back in the day. Light for the last days was written in 1886 and what he began to do and well let me give you a quote there can be no question that those that live to see this year 1917 will have reached all the most important perhaps the most momentous of these terminal years of crisis that's in this book now let me explain to you what he did i would have i would have given you all of this the numbers and how it ties together but i'm telling you it would have bogged this message down uh he did this along with a number of other people from different churches and also people that started entire denominations. He, however, was the most successful in his method of what he did. For example, there are certain numbers in the Bible. The book of Daniel mentions 1,260 days, and there's a 1,290 days, then there's a 1,335 days. And those are days. Well, what some people did is they went back to the story of the children of Israel and how that for 40 days they searched out the promised land but came back filled with unbelief that they could not take it. God judged them and said, for every day you did not believe, you will spend one year in the wilderness. Now, it's what it's called is a day for a year or a year for a day theory. You also see it alluded to in when the prophet of God of the Old Testament is told to sleep on one side for over 300 days and another side for X number of days for the number of years that Israel and Judah had sinned. So God takes the years they had sinned and makes the prophet sleep on that side as an illustrated sermon. And every year represented a day. That's only two examples that we give from the Bible. Guinness would take those dates and he would target what he believed to be the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. And other other methods that he used and again this is very complicated i want to make it as simple as possible then he would take those days mentioned in revelation or daniel and add years to them so instead of 1335 days it became 1035 years then he came to on the gregorian calendar specific years he would then predict certain events or major prophetic events that would change the course of prophecy that would occur on that year. One of the first years in the 1800s, he noted, was the year 1917. Now, let me explain to you from a prophetic perspective, and I'm taking a pen to write a note here, what happened in 1917. The British liberated Palestine 
from the Ottoman Turks after the Turks had had it for 400 years. Number two, the British general Edmund Allenby liberated Jerusalem from the Turks after they had it for 400 years. So you have the British Empire, and it was an empire then, taking over Palestine from the Turks. Then you have Jerusalem being taken over by the British. In 1917, Lord Belfar released the Belfar Declaration giving the Jews access to Palestine. Now remember, the British Empire had control of Palestine. Then they make a decree, Lord Belfar makes a decree that the Jewish people, if they so choose, can have access to go back to Palestine to live. 1917 was also the introduction of, uh, of communism in Russia. It was also the end of World War I. And so many things happened there. So was it a major prophetic year? Yes. Now, Guinness also predicted using these numbers, and again, it would take hours to show you this, the year 1923, and he also spoke about 1934, that there would be a movement related to the restoration of Israel. Well, 1917 was the Belfort Declaration, 1923 was the Palestinian Mandate, 1934 was the rise to Hitler. Now, what's significant about that is because of what Hitler did to the Jewish children and Jewish people, and at least the six million deaths during the Holocaust, it opened up the hearts of the world to allow the Jewish people to restore a homeland, which in 1948 they did, and they named it after the biblical name and also the name that the prophets predicted it would have the nation of Israel. I tell an interesting story. If you've never heard me tell this, I think you'll enjoy this, that uh, President Harry Truman, um, and I'll give you the brief version here, long before he was president, was serving in World War I and was in a foxhole with a Jewish man. And a foxhole, if you don't know what that is, is uh, a trench that they dig out where they're fighting during the battle. And they had, they had time to talk to each other. So Truman asked his friend, the soldier beside him, what are you going to do when the war is over? He said, I'm going to go to New York to the garment district and I'm going to make garments and sell them and get rich. And he looked at Truman and said, what do you think you're going to do? And Truman, just off the cuff, said, I think I'm going to be president of the United States. Well, oddly enough, Harry Truman ended up being president of the United States. Now, Dewey was supposed to defeat Truman in the election. In fact, there's a famous picture of Truman holding up a, a newspaper. And I don't know the exact, I don't have it in front of me, but, you know, Dewey wins. And that was not true. Truman ended up winning. But here's the story. When the choice was made by the United Nations to give the Jews access to Palestine to reform a state or what they used to say, carve out a state, there was a man in the United States who was totally against it. And this, he was a military general. He said, you're going to cause a war among the Arabs and the Jews that is going to be total destruction of everyone. So he was against it. Also, there were uh, a lot of people that were in the government, in the U.S. State Department, who were very anti to the idea of giving the Jews a homeland and especially trying to uh, give them a place and carve it out of Palestine. And, they, and, and I won't go into that. That's in history. Well, to make a long story short, Truman was given a paper to sign to allow this to happen. And there was no name on the paper. And he said, what are we going to call this? We've never done this before. So there were three suggest four suggestions, Judah, Judea, Zion. And finally, uh, and I don't recall if he called his friend or his friend called him, I believe it's the latter, and began to tell him that he was going to be Cyrus. He would be called Cyrus. History would make him a Cyrus if he would allow the Jewish people to go back to Palestine and form a homeland and that uh, it should be called Israel. So he received uh, information from a Jewish rabbi who visited him and his old rabbi friend that was in the trench. And they, de they decided on the name Israel. And I say they, there was more than one person involved with this, of course. And David Ben-Gurion, who was, uh, be, would be elected as the prime minister uh, in his declaration, used the uh, word Israel. But what is significant about that is that that is the name that all of the prophets gave to the country and the nation that would be in existence when the Messiah returns. Now, again, the name used for centuries, for hundreds of years, was simply Palestine. And if you have 
uh, old maps, it still says Palestine. And if you visit Arab nations, uh, the map will still say Palestine. Most of them, I've, I don't think I've ever seen, and I've been to several Arab nations, one that actually publicly uh, shows Israel because of the controversy among a lot of the Arab people and the Palestinian people with that name. We won't get into that. That's uh, more political. And I don't like to get into politics. I like, to, I like to stick to scripture here. So Guinness was a master of this. Now, uh, in, 18, in the 1800s, there was a movement to establish a homeland in Palestine for the Jews with the World Zionist Organization. They believed the Jewish people would never succeed, succeed by assimilating throughout Europe. So in 1896, Theodore Herschel, a Jewish man, published the book, The Jewish State. So my point is all this activity started happening with men who took the Bible and men who studied Bible prophecy. And as this activity began to take place, uh, it, it, it kind of snowballed. It began to grow. Books were printed. So in the late 1800s, the early uh, 1900s, and all the way up until the establishment of Israel in 1948, there were numerous prophetic preachers who at their time had the ear of the parliament in Europe or even the Congress and the Senate in the United States. Uh, one man who desired for Israel to be reestablished as a nation and desired for the Jews to have a homeland in Palestine, met with an evangelist many, many years ago by the name of Billy Sunday. If you've ever studied evangelism, you know who Billy Sunday was. And he, not, he, got, he went right to Billy Sunday's hotel, knocked on the door, introduced himself, and he said, I am interested in uh, you giving me an opportunity to share uh, what I believe about the Jewish people having a homeland. And Billy Sunday looked at him and said, well, I believe that that's connected to the Messiah returning. And the Jewish man said, well, the faster we get it done, the faster he'll come back. Now, the Jewish man did not uh, believe that Christ was the Messiah, but Billy Sunday gave the man the opportunity to speak before he preached. And then Billy got up and preached on the prophecies related to the time of the, the return of the Lord and how they connected to the ancient Israel's concer prophecies concerning Israel and Jerusalem. Well, this man got complete front page publicity. The Jewish man did. And that began a movement again in the United States. Now, the point is, it wasn't just Guinness. It wasn't just William Blackstone. It wasn't just this man I mentioned earlier that had the prophetic conferences. All of this began to climax because uh, to a point because politicians would hear the preaching and be convinced there's something to it. Of course, God allowed the British Empire to take over uh, Palestine, I believe, in order to help a lot of this come to pass. All right, number one, here's what's going to happen. The Gentiles are going to control Jerusalem until the time of the Gentiles are completed. Now, I believe that started, it's not ended yet, but it started in 1967 after the Six-Day War. Number two, the Gentiles are going to preach the gospel uh, until the return of the Lord, and it's connected with the restoration of Israel. Number three, the Gentiles will, will complete their assignment and then the end will come. Now, I'm not making that up. Let me give you the three scriptures. This will come on your screen that you need to see. Luke 21, 24, they will fall above the edges of the sword and be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled or until the time of the Gentile nations controlling the city. Romans 11, 25 and 26. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And there again, when it says blindness in part, and that is blindness in part toward who the Messiah is. It's in part, but when, when, all, when, when everything begins to happen and the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and this is found in the book of Revelation, of course, not in that term, but that's another teaching. Then uh, the eyes of people will be open to see what the scriptures teach. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in uh, earth, even in him. And so this is called the dispensation of the fullness of times. So when we get to the time frame called the fullness of times, and we get to the time frame, which uh, would be called the, the fullness of the Gentiles, then that is when all of your end time events related to the, the tribulation, 
the beast kin kingdom, the 10 kings, the Antichrist, that's the time when all of this will begin to happen. Now, I want to give you one warning from Romans 11. It says that the Gentiles were grafted in because of some of the unbelief uh, 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 with God's original people. But it warns us that if the Gentiles start falling into unbelief, God will remove their branch and graft in again the original branch from the natural tree, which of course, if you read Romans 11, is Israel. I've never seen such belligerence from some Christ, so-called Christian people. I've never seen people just trampling under the blood of Jesus Christ by their, 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 their lies and slanders. I have never seen so many people that are deceived uh, there's people, one guy said, I ain't been to church in nine years because church, uh, no, you're in rebellion when you haven't been to church. And see, you're too, you're too moronic to know that. And I'm not talking about people that can't go. I'm talking about people who refuse to go. So we're in the time of the Gentiles falling into unbelief, which means there's going to be a transition before long. So all of this is in prophecy. It's in prophetic teaching. Now, I have done a prophetic book. If you don't have it, now is the time to get it because it won't be offered forever. I can tell you that. So please get this book and I'll be right back in just a moment. My new book titled The Visions contains specific details of visions and revelations involving future, both national and international events from visions and encounters that I have recorded in my private journal. I've waited for the right prophetic season to disclose these warnings and events. God's Word states that if spiritual watchmen do not warn the people of the danger they see coming, the watchmen will be held accountable for what happens to the people. After experiencing much inner conviction in my soul, I sensed it was the right time to pen what I and others have seen. Much of this book covers warning visions explaining what is coming and how to prepare. I've divided the visions into what was, what is, and what is to come. Here are some of the subjects I will cover in the book. Learn the four different types of spiritual visions. I explain ancient oracles exposing how leaders attempted to see the future. Visions of cities burning both present and future, including New York City. My father's vision of a planned East Coast nuclear attack. Also, my recent visions concerning cremation ovens. I experienced a vision of a frightening assault on a public school that I want to share with you. I have for many years experienced tsunami visions and I've decided to release that information and include the locations that I have seen in those visions. There is a vision of a nuclear power plant that initiates a stock market crash. There's a vision of empty cities and empty streets that I believe is linked to the recent pandemic and possibly another pandemic coming. The vision of the 10 mile radius bioweapons attack on London, England. And also I've seen in three different visions, a strong earthquake impacting the Midwest, especially the St. Louis area. I also talk about the strange vision of three tornadoes that I believe cost Hillary Clinton her political future. I share a vision revealing future attacks on individual Christians and churches. I also talk about when political leaders and their administrations lose divine favor with God. I have a section where I talk about 2024 and beyond, and I've included what I believe to be an interesting historical parallel about a possible Trump second term, the coming revival through the lens of a camera. One of my favorite chapters that's gonna be very helpful to you is this, 10 rules and wisdom principles for surviving and thriving at the end. The book also has important instructions for the reader to follow. When you order this new book, I'm also including my two audio CD teaching, The Battle of the Two Marks, which exposes the future mark of the beast and explains the mystery of the seal of God, both which are alluded to in the book of Revelation. Get the new book and the audio CD now for your donation of $35 or more. Ask for offer VS 141. You can order at perrystone.org or by calling toll free 1-888-21-BREAD or mail your order to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. I hope every prophetic student, intercessor, and those interested to know what is ahead will take time to order this new spiritual resource. I've written this in the fear of the Lord, but I believe it's now the time to release the messages. A remnant is now waking up and preparing. What about you? Man, I trust you enjoyed the program. We love bringing this, these messages to you. We've been on television for 22 years and we are reaching the entire world 
I think we produced 70 to 80 uh, either tapes or different types of um, programming to send to stations in the United States and different, different parts of the country. And so you are a part of this, especially those of you who partner with our ministry. Uh, you help make this possible. Literally every week someone is watching either on our YouTube channel, the Perry Stone YouTube channel, or on television and either coming to know the Lord. We have people that have canceled committing suicide. We have marriages that God has put back together. We have seen people that were depressed and oppressed and the word that God gave them at that moment brought them out. Please get the book, The Visions. Now it will not be offered but only a certain amount of time in the next few weeks and then we move on to another offer. And so we had to go into a second reprinting. We've never had to do that when offering a book for the first time on Manifest, usually later. So we're into the second printing of this book, the most popular book as far as the reading audience that we've ever had in history. And I hope that you'll read it and glean from it and, and see what we believe is coming in the future. God, the Bible says the Lord God knew it doeth nothing except he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. And those are people that just hear from the Lord in my opinion. And so my dad and I have seen things in the spirit and we felt like it was time. And with the war taking place, it really looks like some of these things are on the verge or could occur as a result of what we're seeing. Don't forget perrystone.org or check out our website and I'll see you next week on Manifest. Make plans to attend the 2022 International Prophetic Summit, June 23rd through 26th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. Come hear the latest prophecy updates from Jonathan Kahn, Kurt Landry, Mark Biltz, Bill Cloud, and Perry Stone. This huge event kicks off Thursday night and continues all day Friday and Saturday, concluding in a doubleheader with Bill and Perry on Sunday morning. There is no fee to attend, but you must register online at perrystone.org, where you will also find information on hotels in the area. Seating is limited, so sign up today. Don't miss fresh insights and exciting new prophetic revelation, as each speaker proves that we are living in the end of the age and headed toward a date with destiny, including the return of the Messiah. The 2022 Prophetic Summit. Register now. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2022 Israel tour. The dates are November 20th through the 29th, with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.